Hey everyone, welcome to Broadband Deployment News. Big day today. The uh, Notice of Funding Opportunity has been released by the NTIA for the BEAD program. That's the $42.45 billion in broadband funding that will be available to states uh, in the near future. Well, near future is debatable. I'll be right back. We'll talk about that. Thanks for joining me, Rick Husey here from Zcorm for Broadband Deployment News. Normally I do this just at various times of the day. I'll have uh, some kind of story uh, about broadband deployment, but today, like I say, is a big day. The notice of uh, funding opportunity is out. So I've scheduled this for this time so that we could let some people know that we were gonna be doing this. Uh, I'll try to get it done. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but I did want to uh, walk through some of this NOFO. Um, and you can see here, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave those in YouTube chat uh, right there. If you just want to uh, talk amongst yourselves, I'm fine with that. Um, but uh, I thought I'd go through this. I'm not going to read through the whole thing today. I haven't even read through the whole thing yet. I've gone through some of the beginning. I've looked at some other parts. And I just kind of wanted to highlight some things. And then in uh, broadcasts next week, I'll go through maybe some of the more, more details of these things. So see here, this is the Notice of Funding Opportunity for BEAD, Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. Um, there are some key dates in here. So completed letters of intent, that's the first step, must be received by the NTIA through the application portal no later than 11.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're actually on Eastern Standard Time, I believe, aren't we? No we're, in, no, we're in daylight time. That's right. I forgot. We, we're now on daylight time. So that's right. So EDT on July 18th, 2022. Upon submission of the letter of intent, the point of contact for each eligible, eligible entity, and an eligible entity would be a state or a territory, in, really, as far as this program goes, uh, one of the four territories, uh, also D.C., Puerto Rico. Uh, they may request initial planning funds through the application portal. The portal will provide additional information about submission requirements for funding including but not limited to standard forms and a budget narrative. And then uh, any supplemental information must be sub submitted by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on August 15th, 2022. Eligible entities that receive initial planning funds, and they've got, uh, they've got places in here where you can uh, click. You know, it's not showing up on my screen right now, I think, because of how, it, how I have it displayed, but you can click and go down to some of these, ex, some of these sections that explain further. They must submit a five-year action plan to NTIA within 270 days of receipt of their initial planning funds. So um, again, I'm going to go into more detail in a future broadcast on some of these things, but this is a summary today. Eligible entities will be notified of future submission deadlines following the federal, following FCC's release of the maps required by the broadband deployment by the Broadband Data Act. Um, and that is kind of critical because uh, every state will get $100 million to kind of kick things off, but any additional funds on top of that are going to be based on a formula of how many unserved areas they have in that state compared to all of the unserved areas in all of the states and territories. So in order to know that, we have to have the broadband data maps out and they have to be accurate. Now, where that stands, the FCC has uh, released what they're calling a preliminary broadband location data fabric. So right now they have told service providers that you can start uploading information into this preliminary broadband fabric, this location fabric, to kind of get used to it, so to know what you need to do. Because then starting on June, uh, I believe it's June 1st, or is it June 30th? Uh, it's June to September, basically. I think it might be uh, June 30th to September first. I could have those backwards, but in any event, there's a time frame when then every service provider that's providing broadband service right now will have to load in where they are providing broadband service down to the address, down to a location ID. Once that's done, then the broadband maps will be out and there'll be some challenging back and forth. And then after that process is done, the NTI will then say, okay, here's all of the areas that are served and unserved. And then they will be able to calculate through the formula how much each how much additional each state is going to get. So that's basically what's going to happen there. Uh, application submission address, it's got the address here, or it's got the location where you do this. Can't do it any other way. Uh, it says you can't go postal email, career email, facsimile, or anything else. Those will not be accepted. Uh, funding opportunity description, uh, broadband planning, deployment, mapping, equity, and adoption activities. Uh, that's what it's for. Funding is distributed primarily based on the relative number of unserved locations. 
uh, lack of, la that lack access to reliable broadband service at speeds of at least 25 megabits per second downstream and 3 meg upstream, and latency levels low enough to support real-time interactive applications. So um, that is what unserved is. So if you are less than 25 by 3, that's an unserved location. Each state is to receive, and oh, and latency levels, I, I believe it's defined a little bit further down in here where that's less than 100, 100 milliseconds uh, latency, I believe. Each state is eligible to receive a minimum of $100 million, and each territory is eligible to receive a minimum of $25 million. So basically, each state can get up to 10% uh, of that $100 million that they can use for planning. And then, that, and then each territory, the four territories, and you can see them listed here, uh, American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and the Virgin Islands, they all split $100 million. And then they get uh, a quarter of that. They get $25 million for their uh, planning purposes as well. Or they get $25 million, excuse me, and they get 10% of that for their planning purposes. So uh, who, what's, who's eligible? Any state of the U.S., D.C., Puerto Rico, and then the, uh, those territories, as I mentioned. So anticipated amounts, uh, each state's eligible to receive their $100 million, and then they can request that 10%, $5 million for their initial planning funds. Um, and then again, the same for the territories, they get, uh, they split that among themselves. After the publication of broadband coverage maps being prepared by the FCC, which will be used to determine the number of unserved locations in every state and territory, then the NTI, NTI will notify the eligible entities, the states and the territories of their total funding allocation. So again, we need to know who's unserved before we can figure out how much everybody else gets. Uh, hi, Dave, glad you're here as well. Um, yeah, there are some, some we, got, we have more details in this, which is good. And by the way, I will link to uh, this document so that after the, after the broadcast, I'll put it in the comments and pin that. So if you're looking for this, you can find it. Uh, cost share and matching. Uh, not less than 25% of project costs. Uh, so what they're saying there, and this is interesting. So notice this is not less than 25% of project costs. So it actually could be more than that. And it, I, it was interesting because uh, Drew Clark from Broadband Breakfast did a uh, session with um, Alan Davidson, the uh, Assistant Secretary of the NTIA, who's in charge of all of this, and was kind of making, <laughs> was kind of talking to him about, you know, from what it sounds like you've been saying, it could be actually more than 25%. So I had a little discussion about that, and Alan Davidson said, yeah, we're going to leave it up to the states uh, so they can, they can do that more than that. And it sounds like maybe they're even encouraging a little bit of that as well, as we'll read here. So, um, Again, matching funds for the BEAD program may come from a federal regional commission or authority and from funds that were provided to an eligible entity or a subgrantee for the purpose of deploying broadband service under the, and then it mentions some things where you can use this. So you can't use USF funds, but you can use funds from some recent uh, legislation that came, came through, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 or the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Those were both uh, very pandemic oriented, but um, the American Rescue Plan went straight to the states, and a lot of them have already deployed or uh, allocated money from that, but a lot of them probably have money left over, and they could use that to help with these matching funds. And that's to the extent permitted by those laws. I have a question here. Uh, how will this affect RDOF areas? For example, Charter Communications has been authorized to build out in my location, which is unserved with a time span between 2022 to 2028. Um, you will be excluded if Charter Communications, um, I believe, can document or prove that they're going to be building out. Uh, I guess it depends because these these have to be built out within like four years of the time that this money is released uh, to the entity, so the service provider. So um, I think that's going to be an open question as to there are going to be a lot of areas that are going to be under construction or preparing for construction from previous programs, from RDOF funds, from ARPA, or just in general, just privately funded that are going to be in process. So that is kind of an open question there. Uh, but I think if they can document that that area is going to be covered within this time frame, that's going to be considered served because they do not want to duplicate. If there's federal funds that are going to be applied, especially if it's federal funds, really, that's the key, I guess. If there's federal funds that are going to be applied to an area, they're not going to want to duplicate that by then putting um, bead money on top of that. Uh, there's a program description in here. The NOFO structure um, talks about, you know, there, in this in this NOFO, there's a program description, federal reward information, eligibility, program sequencing, et cetera, in here. I'm just going to skip through this for now and start here. I'm going to skip through a lot of the background. This is why we're doing this. I think we're all pretty familiar with that. It talks about the amount of money. 
$42.45 billion. Uh, the program's principal focus will be on deploying broadband service to unserved locations, those without any broadband service at all, or with broadband service, again, less than 25 by 3, and underserved, which would be less than 100 by 20. Um, eligible entities that demonstrate they will be able to ensure service to all unserved and underserved locations will be free to propose plans that use remaining funds in a wide variety of ways. So it's very possible um, that they will be able to use that money to overbuild areas that already have that are already considered served if they've demonstrated that they're going to completely cover unserved and underserved areas first, as well as probably uh, anchor institutions. And I don't know if that money will be allocated after they get all of that deployed, but it sounds like they're leaving that door open. With respect to the deployment, and by the way, that's for affordability, so they wanna make sure that there's um, good competition in areas to help drive down prices as well. With respect to the deployment of last mile broadband infrastructure, the program prioritizes projects designed to provide fiber connectivity. That's very interesting. So it mentions in here, they wanna prioritize fiber, looking at that as maybe the most future-proof technology that we have, and that would be directly to the end user. It also requires all projects to provide low cost, a low cost option to eligible subscribers, it requires all states to have plans to address middle mile affordability, or excuse me, middle, middle class affordability, and further prioritizes proposals that improve affordability to ensure that networks built using taxpayer dollars are accessible to all Americans. The framework set out below will provide eligible entities, the states, flexibility to pursue deployments in the manner best suited to their populations, including, for example, the deployment of Wi-Fi service within multifamily buildings. So they're allowing for that as being part of this. <laughs> and actually, in, in MDUs, uh, another Another option is using G.HN, which is, might even be better because you, that's a technology where you can use existing wiring, including coax, if there's already coax in the building, even power lines, but it works best over coax as far as distance, where you could get gigabit speeds using existing wiring and G.HN technology. So I will post something about that as well for anybody that's interested. Uh, process overview. Broadly speaking, the process contemplated by the Infrastructure Act and this NOFO is as follows. Again, here's the date for the letter of intent. The request for initial proposal, initial planning funds. Uh, so either with its letter of intent or afterwards, the state can request this. They may request up to five million initial planning funds, or less than that, the 1.25 million if they're a uh, a uh, territory. If the eligible entity requests initial planning funds, it must submit an application for that by 11:59 p.m. EDT, August 15th, and a five-year action plan within 270 days of receipt of their initial planning funds. So kind of review there. So notice of available amounts. On or after the date on which the broadband data maps are made public, then the NTIA will invite the submission of initial grant proposals, initial proposal, and a final grant proposal. So that will be after the maps. Uh, technical assistance leading up to submission of the initial proposal and throughout the remainder of the process, NTIA will provide support and technical assistance and will include interactive feedback on draft uh, on the draft and initial, excuse me, initial draft and final proposal. So that's good news. So if you put that proposal out there, the initial one and or your, you know, your initial one and the final one, you are going to have a chance to get feedback from them. But you want to make sure you get that in early because you don't want to wait till the deadline. I don't know if they're going to be giving you iterative feedback if you put it in on the deadline. Maybe they will, but I would imagine they'll be prioritizing those people that get in earlier as far as uh, getting feedback to them. So initial proposal, eligible entities will have 180 days. From the receipt of the SNOFO, or no, excuse me, the receipt of the notice of available amounts, so that's after they know the amounts, to develop and submit an initial proposal. So 180 days after they do, after they tell you how much you're going to get. Uh, you've got to describe the competitive process to select grant subgrantees. The initial proposal must be made available for public comment. So you've got to put that out there so the public can comment. And the initial proposal must incorporate local coordination feedback. They're really looking for the states to engage uh, to do local engagement, um, get feedback with stakeholders that are going to be doing this. That would be the service providers, that would be local communities, uh, not nonprofits, any kinds of groups that would have uh, any kind of feedback here. They want to make sure they're collecting that. There's a, there'll be a challenge process. So after submission of the initial proposal and before allocating any funds, any bead funds received for deployment of broadband networks to subgrantees. A uh, state must conduct a challenge process. Under this process, a unit of local government, nonprofit organization, or broadband service provider can challenge a determination made by the state in the initial proposal as to whether a particular location or community anchor institution 
within the jurisdiction of the state is eligible for the grant funds, including whether a particular location is unserved or underserved, and eligible entities must submit any successful challenges to NTIA for review and approval. So I don't know how that uh, works together with the broadband maps, because my understanding is the broadband maps are also going to have a challenge process, and I thought that was all going to be taken care of through the FCC and some challenge process within that mapping infrastructure or, or program. So I don't know if this is separate. So the broadband maps are going to say one thing, and that's going to be what the NTIA is leaning on as far as who is really unserved and underserved. So all these state maps that are out there, they're good to have now before the federal maps are out, but they don't count. The ones that are going to count are the federal maps. So uh, this may be something in addition, a challenge process in addition to that, although I would think that people will be able to challenge that through the maps as well, assuming that's a separate process. Initial funding availability. NTI will review initial proposals as expeditiously as possible. Once the initial proposal is approved, NTI will make available to the state. I'm going to keep saying state. <laughs> but you know what that is, not less than 20% of the total grant funds allocated to the state. So that's the, the initial funding and then uh, subgrantee selection. A state may initiate its competitive subgrantee selection process upon approval of the initial proposal and will have up to one year to conduct additional local coordination, complete the selection process, and submit a final proposal to NTIA. So that's why I was saying uh, these funds, you know, depending on how you look at it, how soon we'll be getting them, it's not going to be this year, okay? And it's going to be, as you can see, sometime into next year, uh, well into next year, I think, before these funds are actually released. Uh, the eligible entity may, at this point, utilize the funding provided, not less than 20% of the total grant, to in initiate certain activities. And there's a section where, again, on the document, you should be able to click and go down there. Uh, final proposal. After the state has selected subgrantees and otherwise executed its initial proposal, it will submit a final proposal describing how it complied with that initial proposal and the results of the process. NTI will award the remaining funds allocated to the state upon approval of the final proposal and eligible entities will initiate their subgrants for the remaining 80% of funding and any portion of the original 20% that the state had not yet awarded. Prior to submission to NTIA, the final proposal must be made available for public comment. So again, another period of public comment on that final proposal. Ongoing monitoring, reporting, and performance management. Uh, throughout the BEAD program, the NTIA will conduct ongoing monitoring of a state's progress against its plans. <coughs> NTI strongly encourages each eligible entity participating in the BEAD program to concurrently participate in the programs established under the Digital Equity Act of 2021. That's a, another chunk of money, which provides $2.75 billion to further advance federal goals related, relating to digital equity and digital inclusion. Just as the BEAD program begins with a five-year action plan, the Digital Equity Act begins with state digital equity planning grants, which is subject, which is the subject of a separate NOFO. So there's a separate NOFO for that. And they're encouraging people because there are, this is, this is broadband equity access and deployment. So this has some equity aspects in it as well. And they're encouraging states to participate in that 2.75 billion. And if they do, to try to coordinate everything that they're doing together there. The five-year action plan, that a state develops for the BEAD program should therefore incorporate the eligible entity's state digital equity plan. So if they are going to do that, they, they're going to incorporate that state digital equity plan as an eligible entity cannot have a five-year plan that does not address digital equity. So I, excuse me, so they're going to have to do that anyway. You've got to submit this state digital equity plan. So you might as well go for this 2.75 as well. Moreover, initial proposals and final proposals developed for the BEAD program should be informed by and be complementary to and closely integrated with the state's five-year action plans and state digital equity plans to address the goal of universal broadband access and deployment. Eligible entities should ensure coordination between BEAD planning teams and state digital equity planning teams and should establish a formal and direct communication and collaboration pathway between the teams. So again, uh, tight coordination there. Uh, once again, trying not to duplicate funds. Uh, so you've got digital equity and you want to make sure that, you know, if, if you're working under, on something equity-wise under BEAD, that you, are, that you don't duplicate that and vice versa through the other program. Uh, some definitions in here. Aging individual. The term aging individual means an individual who is 60 years of age or older. I resemble that remark. Uh, that was a little upsetting to me. Uh, broadband broadband, broadband service. Uh, this is really vague and makes, 
uh, this is irrelevant almost, a mass broad, they define broadband as a mass market retail service by wire or radio that provides the capability to transmit data to and receive data from all or substantially all internet endpoints, including any capabilities that are incidental to and enable the operation of the communication service, but excluding dial-up internet access service. So it excludes dial-up, which is good. The FCC's definition of broadband currently is 25 by 3. Uh, so, and that's, that's the threshold for uh, being served, excuse me, for being unserved. Under that is unserved. If you're above that, up to 100, you're underserved. So the definition of broadband today from the FCC is actually underserved, unless you're over 100. Um, community anchor, anchor institutions, a school, library, health clinic, health center, hospital or other medical provider, public safety, entity, institution of higher education, public housing organization, or community support organization that facilitates greater use of broadband service by vulnerable populations, including but not limited to low-income individuals, unemployed individuals, children, the incarcerated, and aged individuals, or aging, maybe, I don't know, aged individuals. Um, and community anchor institutions would be the, um, the next priority. So it goes uh, unserved, underserved, and then, and then you can allocate to community anchor institutions that do not have gigabit symmetrical service would be the next place those funds are supposed to go. Uh, eligible community anchor institution means a community anchor institution that lacks access to gigabit level broadband service, as I said. So they would be eligible for those funds. Um, extremely high cost per location threshold. I didn't understand this. I'm going to have to look into this further. So it's an extremely high cost per location threshold is a bead subsidy cost for location to be utilized during the subgrantee selection process described in that section of this NOFO above within, and I looked at that, still didn't make sense, which an eligible entity may decline to, this is, this didn't make sense, I, I need to look into this, which an eligible entity may decline to select a proposal if use of an alternative technology meeting the BEAD program's technical requirements would be less expensive. Maybe that has to do with, you can go ahead and use fixed wireless and not fiber if it's a very, very high cost area. I don't know if that it doesn't include satellite, by the way. Um, so I don't know what that means. High cost area. Uh, term high cost area means an unserved area in which the cost of building out broadband service is higher as compared with the average cost of building out broadband service in unserved areas in the United States, as determined by uh, Mr. Davidson. Incorpor incorporating facts that include the remote location of the area, the lack of population density of the area, the unique topography of the area, high rate of poverty in the area, or any other factory identified by the Assistant Secretary in consultation with the FCC, uh, <clears throat> or that, the Commission, I'm assuming that's the FCC. Uh, NTIA will release further information regarding the identification of high cost areas for purposes of bead funding allocations at a later date. So that's good news. They're going to kind of provide more information on that later, because that's not exactly clear. Uh, Non-traditional broadband provider. The term non-traditional broadband provider means an electric co-op, nonprofit organization, public-private partnership, public or private utility, public utility district, tribal entity, or local government. A uh, project that will, pro priority broadband project, a project that will provision service via end-to-end -end fiber optic facilities, fiber optic, to each end user, an eligible entity may disqualify any project that might otherwise qualify as a priority broadband project from priority broadband project status with the approval of the Assistant Secretary on the basis that the location surpasses the eligible entity's extreme high cost per location threshold. So again, maybe fiber, maybe it could be a priority broadband project, uh, if not fiber, if it is an extremely high cost area, or for other valid reasons subject to approval by the Assistant Secretary. Um, so Dave asked about IPv6. Um, yeah, I'm not sure the question there, Dave, but uh, you know, these, are all, these are all gonna be set up, I'm sure, as IPv6 networks. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't need IPv4 addresses because the internet, there's still a lot of IPv4 websites out there. That's why people need to get IPv4 addresses or have something like carrier grade NAT to do a translation, even if they're a brand new service provider, because if you are an IPv6 network and you've got subscribers on the network, they need to be able to reach IPv4 content. Um, Conway Fan 98, I hope overbuilding does happen after everyone's is served. Charters, gig service is very expensive. That, that is what they're trying to do is to keep prices down. Um, 
project, and by the way, if anybody takes money from this, they have to have, they have to provide a low cost solution. And the Biden administration just the other day worked with, um, I think Charter was one of them. Yeah, I believe so. Worked with um, service providers on saying that they would provide a hundred meg product for $30. And I'm not totally clear if that is available to everybody or only people on ACP. They should really make it available to everybody since ACP, AC, people on ACP can get any product that they want, any plan that they want, and get that $30 subsidy. So uh, just be aware of that. Uh, project. The term project means an undertaking by a subgrantee to construct and deploy infrastructure for the provision of broadband service. A project may constitute a single unserved or underserved broadband serviceable location, which is very interesting because I was really confused, you know, because you have, you're trying to get 80% had to be unserved in order for that to be a project. If it was, or 80% need to be underserved and unserved for that to be a project. So what they're saying here is an underserved or unserved project can be one home, one location, if that area does not have uh, good broadband service, if it's not, let's say 100 by 20. Uh, so I guess 80% of one is 80%, <laughs> right? So that's how that works. So a project can be one home, but obviously they'd prefer that um, you, you know, that the service providers and the states, you know, they make sure that they're getting larger tracts of area that are unserved or underserved and try to do that in the most economical way possible. Uh, reliable broadband service. The term reliable broadband service means broadband service that the uh, FCC maps show is accessible to a location via fiber optic technology, cable modem, hybrid fiber coax, DSL, okay, as long as it's gonna be this over 100 megabits per second, or terrestrial fixed wireless technology utilizing entirely licensed spectrum or using a hybrid of licensed and unlicensed spectrum. So you can't do completely unlicensed uh, and have that be reliable broadband service according to this document. And you cannot do satellite. It mentions that later down here. So satellite will not qualify. So Starlink, which is floating above our heads right now and can provide service in lots and lots of areas, that does not qualify for funds here. And that will be interesting to see what happens with RDOP because uh, Spacelink, uh, Starlink, SpaceX, excuse me, SpaceX, Starlink did win a lot of RDOP money in lots of different locations and they've not been awarded anything yet. I would not be surprised if they're not awarded anything based on this, although uh, the two are not really connected. Um, but I would expect the only, the only places they might be awarded would be really high cost, hard to reach areas if they get any RDOF funds from that. And uh, if they do get RDOF funds from that, the way I read this, if they do get some RDOF funds in particular areas, that would not be considered an area uh, that has reliable broadband service. So even if they get a swath of territory on RDOF, then somebody can go in and overbuild that because it would not count as reliable broadband service. Again, so I think they would be getting only areas that are very hard to reach if they get any at all through RDOF. Let's see, un underserved location. The term underserved location means a broadband serviceable location. Again, that uh, through the maps, not, it's not an unserved location, so it's above that. Uh, and it shows that they're lacking access to 100 by 20 and latency less than or equal to 100 milliseconds. So here it further defines that latency that can do all kinds of interactive stuff. So. Uh, equal to or less than 100 milliseconds, which was the same as was in RDOF. Uh, underserved service project is, uh, again, a project with not less than 80% of broadband service locations or one home <laughs> served by the project are in unserved or underserved locations. And again, that can be as small as one serviceable location. Unserved location, 25 by three, we talked about that. Latency less, uh, equal to or less than 100 milliseconds. Unserved service project, same thing, 80% or one home, could be a single home. Funding award information, uh, again, about $41.601 billion. Uh, period of performance, we talked about the letter intent. Again, this is just a review. Letter of intent, July 18th. All requests for planning funds by August 15th. Five-year action, plan, action plans, 270 days after their receipt of initial planning funds. Um, Subgrantees that receive BEAD program funds for network deployment must deploy the planned broadband network and begin providing services to each customer that desires broadband service within the project area, not later than four years after the date on which the subgrantee receives the subgrant from the eligible entity or the state. So once they get the money, they've got four years to build it all out. Extensions, uh, an eligible entity or state may extend the four-year network deployment deadline for subgrantees by no more than one year 
If the subgrantee has a specific plan for use of the grant funds with project completion expected by a specific date, not more than one year after the four-year deadline, uh, the construction project is underway, or extenuating circumstances require an extension of time to allow the project to be completed. Petition for extension, each eligible entity must develop a process by which subgrantees may request extensions and provide documentation about qualifying circumstances that warrants that. And um, I, don't, I don't know if they took, when developing this four-year timeline, I don't know if they took the supply chain situation into account. It's very hard to get fiber right now. So it's out like a year lead time. So I don't know if that's taken into account. Of course, this money is going to be allocated for probably a year. Uh, so anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, Five million again in initial planning funds. Treatment of unallocated unused funds. If a state fails to submit a covered application, letter of intent, proposal, final proposal, initial and final, by the applicable deadline, applicable deadline, or any subsequent resubmission deadlines, if provisions are needed, a political subdivision or consortium of political subdivisions of the state may submit the applicable type of covered application in place of the state. If a state and its political sub subdivisions or consortiums fail to submit a covered application by the deadline, including in deadlines for revisions, and no extension is granted, the assistant secretary may reallocate the amounts that would have been available to that state uh, to the states that did not submit or that did submit and receive approval by the application deadline. So, for example, if one state doesn't get all of their forms in, then that could go to another state. Such reallocation will be based on the percentage of unserved locations in each eligible entity. If an eligible entity fails to use the full allocation made to that entity by the applicable deadline, the assistant, assistant secretary may reallocate the unused amounts to other states, so to speak. <clears throat> Type of funding instrument would be a grant. Um, match, uh, except in certain specific circumstances described herein. Uh, and such as high cost areas and cases where NTI has waived it, each state shall provide, shall provide, require its subgrant grantee to provide or provide in concert with the subgrantee matching funds of not less than 25% of projected costs. So again, that could be over 25% if the state chooses to do that. States should rigorously explore ways to cover a project's cost with contributions outside of the BEAD program funding, matching contributions, including in-kind contributions that lower project costs demonstrate commitment to a particular project and minimize BEAD funding outlay, extend the reach of the BEAD program funding and help ensure that every unserved location and underserved location in the US has access to reliable, affordable, high-speed internet. In some cases though, a match requirement could deter participation in the BEAD program by small and non-traditional providers in marginalized or low-income communities or could threaten affordability. For example, if the applicant seeks to offset the cost of the substantial match through a higher end user price. In those cases, uh, a state may, should consider ways to cover part or all of the provider's match through eligible entity or other funds to seek a match waiver through the process explained below. So they want the service providers to have skin in the game, but if that's gonna hinder the goals of the program, they are willing to uh, waive those. Matching contribution may be provided by the subgrantee, an eligible entity, a unit of the local government, Utility company, cooperative, nonprofit, philanthropic organization, or for profit company, regional planning or government organization, federal regional commission authority, or any combination thereof. Uh, as detailed in this, this section referenced here, a state may seek and the assistant secretary may grant a partial or full waiver of the non federal match requirement where warranted. <clears throat> Preference for maximum subgrantee contribution and minimal bead subsidy. So. They're wanting people to submit at least 25%, it sounds like, or maybe more, because uh, the minimum is 25%. It says a preference for maximum. Eligible entities are encouraged to require a match from the subgrantee rather than utilizing other sources where it deems the subgrantee capable of providing matching funds. Again, having some skin in the game there. Eligible entities are also required to incentivize matches of greater than 25% from subgrantees wherever feasible. So maybe give them an incentive to, to do more than 25%. Um, when Alan Davidson was on with Drew Clark, he mentioned the fact that through RDOF, they learned a lot about what service providers were willing to do because as people were doing that reverse auction and saying, hey, I will, I will, I will accept this much support, and you know, it was descending auctions, so they kept accepting less and less support. A lot of them were at 50%, so um, that, they, they learned a lot from that. So they're encouraging maybe to be a higher match, and that will make greater use of the funds, obviously. 
and TIA will provide technical assistance to eligible entities to assist in making these determinations. Uh, states will be expected to explain in their initial proposals how they intend to ensure that subgrantees will offer the maximum feasible match for each project. Matches from other federal programs and entities, uh, again, it mentions the, the two uh, pandemic programs here. And also, it mentions loans funding issued through a federal agency such as the USDA ReConnect program may also be used as a match fund. In-kind matches, uh, matching funds may be provided in the form of either cash or in-kind contributions. In-kind contributions, which may include third-party in-kind contributions or non-cash donations of property, goods, or services, which benefit a federally assisted project and which may count towards satisfying the non-federal matching requirement of a project's total budgeted costs when such contributions meet certain criteria. NTI encourages applicants to thoroughly consider potential sources of an in-kind contributions that, depending on the particular property or service and the applicable federal cost principles, could include employee or volunteer services, equipment, supplies, indirect costs, computer hardware and software, and use of facilities. In the broadband context, this could include consistent, consistent with federal cost principles, waiver of fees associated with access to rights of way, pull attachments, conduits, easements, or access to other types of infrastructure. So a municipality, a utility could uh, get their matching funds or a portion of them through these in-kind contributions of rights of way that they already have access to. Uh, match waivers, the assistant secretary will generally seek to minimize the bead funding outlay on a particular project to extend the program's reach and expects to grant waivers only in special circumstances when waiver is necessary to advance objectives that are critical to the program's success. An eligible entity must submit a request that describes the special circumstances underlying the request and explain how a waiver would serve the public interest and effectuate the purposes of the bead program. The assistant secretary retains the discretion to waive any amount of the match, including up to the full 25%. So that's all I was going to cover today. I'm going to go through uh, details. You know, this document gives more details on these different sections that I'm going to go through on future days of this. So if you are not um, subscribed, make sure that you click the subscribe button. You should see one in the lower portion of this, this video frame or down in the YouTube application. Click subscribe, click the bell to be notified when I'm live and you'll know when I'm live on these uh, upcoming broadcasts. Uh, seeing some comments here. Um, Let's see what I've got here. So, so Dave says, I foresee a ton of Starlink lawyers descending on Washington. Yeah, very true. Do hope more have some, seen some of the data on Starlink's actual performance I've published. Yeah, the performance has been up and down. There was a while there where it was down below 100 megabits per second. And I think that's as they, as they add more subscribers, you know, it's going to drop the... Uh, drop the performance. So the more, the more successful they are, the lower the, the speeds go down. That, that's the same with any broadband operator, but it's a lot harder for a satellite operator to get their infrastructure to beef it up, right? So uh, yeah, I, I would see that being a problem. Uh, Philip says, looks like this included middle mile program too. Thought that was going to be addressed by a separate NOFO. So did I. I haven't looked through all of this entire thing, so if there's middle mile in here, then I would be surprised, but it's possible, I guess. So I haven't read through this whole document. It may just be talking about middle mile. For example, it does talk about you can use, you can use the funds from BEAD for middle mile if it's to improve. So, and that's important, actually. I think there will be a separate NOFO. I think there will be a separate NOFO for middle mile, but a state like Alaska, for example, when uh, uh, Secretary Raimondo was on, uh, was talking to the Senate and they were asking her questions. She mentioned she was talking to, I think it was Senator Murkowski about middle mile uh, because in Alaska, middle mile is a serious issue. Whereas in Rhode Island or you know where uh, Secretary Raimondo is from, it's maybe not such a serious issue. Uh, but in Alaska, they can use a lot of the money that they're gonna get from this for middle mile infrastructure because there's only a billion dollars for middle mile and Alaska will get a portion of that. Um, but you know, they can use this, they can use the bead program for that. So I think there will be a separate NOFO for that. Uh, with labor and supply chain issues, expecting a lot of requests for extension, I would agree. And assuming they can document that, yeah, they had to wait a year for something, uh, you're right. You're watching this, uh, Conway Fan 98 watching this on live stream with a 1.5 DSL, not reliable. Yeah. Yeah. You need better service there. Um, yeah. So yeah, Philip, uh, Chris says, yeah, middle mile is separate NOFO, uh, Let's see what else we got here. Uh, letter of credit requirements, 25%, just like RDOF. 
From what org can I expect anything resembling a technical detail like IPv6, queue management, router security? Um, that, you know, if there's issues about that related to, um, related to broadband, uh, the BEAD program, for example, or anything else related to the Infrastructure Act, there will be a lot of, you'll, you will see lots of webinars from the NTIA that will be explaining this and they'll be asking questions of people, you know, what do you need to know? So um, I think it's going to be the NTIA or possibly, uh, you know, you could go through your state who will then get through the NTIA. The NTIA has a, they're supposed to have a representative, uh, a support person for every state at the NTIA. They're really going through a process of trying to hire lots of people so they can manage this. So I think you'll be able to get information related to uh, the BEAD program, anything in the Infrastructure Act through, uh, through your state. And then again, uh, they'll be doing lots of training on this. Uh, Chris, you're welcome. Thanks for joining me. And uh, may want to mention the letter of credit requirement. That is huge. I will look through that and mention that next time. Thanks for bringing that up, Philip. Thanks for joining me today. Again, if you are um, not subscribed, please uh, go ahead and click the subscribe button on YouTube or down in the uh, lower tiny little button, not the one on the screen here, that doesn't work, but the tiny little button uh, on the screen, the video screen. If uh, this was helpful to you and you liked it, please give me a like on the video. I always like to see those. And I will be back Monday, I don't think at a particular time. I'll look through the document again. If there's something really earth-shaking, I may schedule a time and send out a notification to some folks that we're going to be live. But uh, otherwise, I will just at some point read through it. And when I'm ready, I will stream and look at some additional details on this NOFO. So thanks again. I will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.